Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Greetings, everyone, and a warm welcome to day two of the Tourism Match League Conference, co-hosted by Colorado State University's Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources and the Center for Protected Area Management. Uh, my name is David Knight. I'm faculty in the department here at CSU and co-chair of the conference, along with professor and head of the department, Dr. Mike Manfredo, and with the director of the Center for Protected Area Management, Ryan Finchel. At the outset of day two here, I really want to thank the true organizers and leads for this year's conference, who are based with me, Mike, and Ryan here in the Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources at CSU. So really, you know, if I had, if we all had glasses of wine in hand, I would love to lead us all in a thunderous applause and, uh, and a clinking of cups right now in honor of Paul Layden and Emily LeBlanc, who have been so pivotal in bringing this entire conference uh, together and uh, pulling everything off for all of us. So big round of applause, thanks to Paul and Emily. As Ryan mentioned yesterday, this is the fifth iteration of the conference since its initiation in 2016. The conference is supported by a foundational consortium of several universities based in Asia, Europe, and the Americas who are listed at the beginning of your conference program. They introduced themselves yesterday and have been present throughout the conference in various capacities as speakers, sponsors, and participants. And I just wanna give another, just a big shout out to each of you, many, many thanks. Uh, this partnership uh, is very meaningful, I think for all of us. So as part of that consortium, I also want to give a shout out to the team at Degendorf Institute of Technology in Germany for leading a successful virtual conference last year. Um, yeah, it's a marvelous conference, also virtual. And uh, before I talk a, a little bit more about um, uh, some, some of the logistics and things going on in day two here, I wanna highlight a book um, by several of the individuals who are part of our consortium team. And that book is entitled uh, Nature-Based Tourism and Wellbeing, Impacts and Future Outlook. So as you can actually see in the conference program, the authors are going to be presenting on that book uh, today uh, in the session at 12.30 p.m. Uh, until 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So for this year's conference, we have more than a thousand individuals registered from over 50 countries. And I just wanna point out that some are joining us live uh, and many others will be returning to the Huba site later to view the, the presentations, all of which are being recorded and will be available for several months after the conference ends. So uh, in terms of today, uh, building on yesterday's topics, presenters in the remaining sessions are going to be exploring uh, crucial themes associated with ski areas, climate change, sustainable travel and island destinations, university tourism programs, graduate student research, and insights into industry trends and career advice from uh, a couple of representatives of both the private and pu public sectors. Um, hopefully you'll see that students represent a really important audience and focus for this day two of the conference. Um, and I, I think it's worth pointing out that students actually comprise nearly half of our 1000 plus registrants. So uh, a warm welcome to our students joining in today. Uh, as well as to the rest of you, of course. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the day, Jim Barbarak, a close friend and colleague who will be launching us uh, in just a minute into our day two presentations. So uh, just a quick bio on uh, background on Jim. Jim Barbarak is now the senior advisor and was previously the co-director of the Colorado State University Center for Protected Area Management. Previously, he worked for Conservation International for four years as coordinator of the protected areas and corridors unit in Mexico and Central America. And previously for 15 years as a specialist 
in protected areas for the Wildlife Conservation Society. He has his, B, uh, his Bachelor of Science and his Master of Science degrees in natural resources, and he studied at Ohio State University and Yale. His areas of interest include staff training, planning, and management of protected areas, corridors and buffer zones, development of financial strategies, public use, and institutional strengthening for parks and reserves, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, and conservation and management of wildlife. So all that to say, Jim, it's great to see you on here. You're looking good. And uh, I will pass the baton to you. Warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Can you see my presentation here? It's looking good. Yes. Great. So thank you very much, David. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all, particularly the large number of students that are watching in today. And uh, one of the things that I would like to stress is that yesterday, most of our speakers talked about things through a sustainable tourism lens, because that's the focus of their lives and work and their passion. Uh, I'm passionate and I focus my career on protected area management, saving spaces and the species that live within them for human welfare. And so I'm going to come at it at a, a slightly different uh, approach from most of our speakers yesterday. And the idea is to complement those uh, with the point of view of those of those that are in the protect areas profession and uh, the relationship of protected areas management to sustainable tourism. So in just a few weeks in Montreal, Canada, a meeting is going to be held that was originally supposed to be held two, two years ago in Kunming, China. Andrew Rhodes uh, spoke briefly about this yesterday. All the nations of the world that have ratified the Convention on Biodiversity, which is just about every country on earth, except the United States, and we'll be there as observers, will meet to come up with an agenda through the year uh, 2030 and also with stretch goals to 2050 regarding biodiversity and protection of the world's biological resources. And one of the goals that we know is going to be agreed on at that meeting that's already been embraced by over 90 countries led by Costa Rica, France, and England that have signed a high ambition coalition on nature is to protect 30% of the world's uh, area on land and in seas in one type or another of protected area or other effectively managed natural areas. And uh, this is a, a huge goal because right now we're only at about 17% on land and less than 10% in the world's oceans. So it's nearly doubling the amount of protected areas in, on land and tripling them in the oceans in just about eight years. The first thing we have to be recognized, those of us both in the tourism business and in conservation, is that tourism is a huge ally to help us gain public support for protected areas, but it is a myth and we should not embrace the idea that tourism can ever cover most of the cost of managing either existing protected areas or those new ones we need to create to meet that, that goal of 30% protected on land and in oceans. Even in the United States, our National Park Service, which has been around since 1916, only covers about 10% of its total budget of several billion dollars through entrance fees, use fees, concession fees, basically through tourism. And so the thing here we have to understand is that we can never stop depending on other sources of funding if we expect to effectively manage protected areas. And what we need to focus on regarding tourism and what its contribution is that tourism fund the protected areas recreation and tourism programs and support them so they are excellent, but we can't expect tourism to cover the cost of rangers and scientific research and land acquisition and a number of the other things involved in protected area management. We also need to embrace, and Andrew mentioned this yesterday, a, a, a wide range of governance approaches to managing these parks and reserves. And this includes governments at all levels. There are many countries where municipal and regional governments still don't have protected area systems. They have a huge role to play, particularly in urban and peri-urban protected areas. Uh, it's now accepted that tribes and communities usually do a better job than governments at managing their traditional areas where they've lived many times for centuries. So we need to embrace more community and tribal uh, co-management. Uh, NGOs around the world uh, manage both small ones, uh, local ones, and even big international ones, manage some of the world's best loved and cherished protected areas in partnership with governments, uh, groups, gr groups uh, for example, in Latin America and 
In Africa, this is particularly the case with groups like Africa Parks, for example. We need to be open to the role of for-profit enterprises. They know what visitors need. They are good at providing services. And uh, compared to government, if any of you have ever stayed in a government-run hotel, you know that government is not very good at providing tourism services. So we need to, pro we need to partner with for-profit enterprises, but with a focus not just on large multinational corporations to run big hotels and the like, but increasingly on providing more opportunities for small and medium-sized locally-owned enterprises as partners in managing protectors. Universities have a huge role to play. Uh, for example, our university has two different protected areas, one where we do environmental education right in the heart of Fort Collins for all the local school kids, and another where we train our students that's right next to a national park and national forest uh, up in the high alpine area of Colorado. And universities also play a key role in, uh, in conducting research, social and biological research. And we need to uh, embrace the role of concessionaires in particular. Uh, last night, I was uh, uh, lecturing to a group of Chinese students from CCNU, and they were giving case studies. And almost all of the parks they're reporting on in China, in China, uh, were actually managed by for-profit enterprises in partnership with government. So this is a concept being braced around the world because we know the governments don't have the staff or the money to do the job uh, universally. And, and, and building on that, we really need to not be lone rangers or to work alone. We need to build social capital using a variety of, of different mechanisms. And one of the key ones is reaching out to the tourism industry, building coalitions and alliances in tourism destinations that include one or more protected areas with the for-profit sector, creating friends groups, which many times will be led by or include tourism enterprises, creating consultative committees that should include representatives of the local tourism sector, doing participatory planning involving the tourism sector, and using a, a range of types of, of public-private partnerships, contracts, agreements, concessions to outsource things that the government cannot do or does not do well. And as part of all this, we also need to reach out to that 20% of the population at any one time who is with some type of, of, of permanent disability or temporary disability or with a group that has at least one person with that situation within them. We need to be accessible and, and, and also inclusive and put much more focus not on just uh, meeting the needs of tourists from around the world, but the neighbors of the protected areas we serve. Uh, we also need to think not just about diversifying within tourism. COVID taught us a lot. Uh, you know, disasters are a terrible thing to waste. And we learned a lot through, uh, through COVID about the need, first of all, to not uh, particularly not rely only on international tourism because it's so fickle and uh, to diversify with uh, local, regional, national audiences, but also to think about diversification beyond tourism, beyond recreation. And we also now know that particularly after COVID, we need to strengthen the role of protected areas in promoting physical and mental health, and also play up that role in our discussions with decision makers and those that control bu budgets about the vital role of protected areas in promoting physical and mental health. Uh, we also, as mentioned, need to not only focus on international tourism. That's one of the greatest lessons of COVID. The, the protected areas that did best in weathering COVID are those that were not just focused on international tourism, but had healthy programs for national, regional, and local visitors that uh, had partnerships with local businesses. And uh, basically, instead of focusing on massive infrastructure funded by international loans that have to be paid back, uh, those areas that focus on simple but high priority infrastructure, things like bathrooms, trails, overlooks, and uh, decent parking lots and providing security to visitors. So this is vital, particularly in these new protected areas that we're going to be creating, to at least make sure that they have the minimal infrastructure to be welcoming to tourists and recreationists locally and from around the world. We also know, and this was alluded to by several of our U.S. speakers, the difficulty of recruiting and retaining good personnel. This is a problem around the world, not just in developing countries. So we need to use a whole range of approaches to meet our personnel needs, because we know that if we focus just on government employees alone, full-time employees, we're going to fall far short of the number of people we need to manage protect areas. So we need to use a wide range of approaches. And we also recognize that uh, in, in addition to just basic infrastructure like trails and parking lots and visitor centers, we need to focus on building environmental education interpretation programs if we really want to have societal support for conservation. Because it's great to have a program focused on visitors from around the world, but if local communities, as several speakers said yesterday, do not support what we're up to, 
we're going to lose. We need to build that societal support. One of the best ways to do this is through, is through outreach programs, environmental education, and by building up a team of world-class guides and interpreters. And hopefully some of you will take on some of those tasks in the future. And we need to not just hire this workforce, we need to give them all types of training, both formal universities like those many of you you're in, but also lifelong training and uh, enhancement of their skills. They need to have the equipment and infrastructure to do their job. Uh, and, and this is a key thing, even in the United States, most of the workforce working even in our national parks and forests do not have full work benefits. So we need to improve salaries, we need to improve benefits, job stability, and the societal recognition of the work of people like guides, rangers, and the like. And we need to focus on building up our local workforce. If you want to build uh, animosity among locals, uh, bring in most of your workforce from someplace else in the country or abroad, and that's a good way to build local animosity. So we need to focus on the local workforce. Uh, we need to focus on evidence-based conservation. That's a big focus of the conservation community now. Focus on what works, on case studies, uh, on comparative studies from around the world, uh, and uh, look at what works under what conditions and replicate that and build it up. I'd like to thank you for uh, the time to be able to speak to you this morning. I wish you all the best in your endeavors. And uh, David, back to you. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm actually going to take over now. Uh, this is Emily LeBlanc, the Conference Coordinator for Human Dimensions of Natural Resources. I'm just hopping back on to let you know that we are heading into our virtual speed networking session right now. Um, this session will take place on the Whova app, so you'll have to log into that app if you're not already logged in. We encourage you to go and connect with everyone else. Uh, it'll be a 30 minute session with 10 minute rooms to talk to two other people in this area. So just so you know, uh, with this speed networking session, it'll give you a 60 minute warning as it is about to end, but then it'll end pretty abruptly after 30 minutes. Uh, and then we will come back into this Zoom session. You can click through in the sessions to get here. Um, and with that, I just want to say thanks again to David for leading us off today. And thank you to Jim for sharing with us. And we'll see you all in the next session. Thank you. Just, really quickly, Emily, I think you said 60 minute warning. It'll give you a 60, 60 second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, David. It'll give you a 60 second oh, warning, not a 60 okay. minute warning. <laughs> all right. Thank Everyone. you. All right.